nice what uh, Tanya said about us, but she's getting even with us by having three follically challenged men stand in front of a floor to ceiling mirror. <laughs> So this is not typically one of my gestures, but for the rest of the <laughs> for the rest of the morning, it's going to be. I'm going to start with a story. Um, it's a legendary story in my it's a legendary story in my family. Um, when my wife Karen and I were first married, we moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and her family's from Philadelphia. It was October. They were coming out for their first visit out to see us. Um, they're golfers. And Karen, my wife Karen, is an anti-golfer because as a, she was a golf orphan growing up. But she said, it's a beautiful October day. Why don't you, the three of you, go golfing, and I'll walk along with you. It'd be this nice social thing, and I'll see how beautiful Wisconsin is. So I'm a terrible golfer, and they're quite good. So I was, I thought, well, OK, for the good of the marriage, I'll do it. So we go to, this, go to the golf course, and around the fifth hole, I'm coming out of the woods yet again, and my wife is walking down the middle of the fairway towards the green with her parents. You know how when you want to catch up to somebody backwards, you sort of just walk a little slower? So she sort of walks backwards to me, stands next to me, and says out of the side of her mouth, if you would just hit it in the fairway, we could all walk together. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Her line is a standard, right? Her line is the her line is duplicated in the Common Core standards. If you would just walk to get that, the standard is to get on the green and get and get and get in the hole. And that's something we have to do. But the fact is, I knew what I was supposed to do. I just couldn't do it. And as funny as that is, I want to argue that every time we write in a student's paper, show don't tell, we're saying precisely the same thing precisely the same thing. So that if we are going to help our students achieve these goals, if we're going to help them be scratch golfers, if you will, then we have to think really, really hard about the kinds of knowledge that they're going to need and the kinds of teaching and composing they're going to have to do in order to develop that, under, that understanding. Oh, this is the commercial. So, um, so let's start by thinking about knowledge. Our, our mentor, George Hillox, um, in 1986 came out with this, uh, with an argument for the kinds of knowledge writers need. He said, in essence, writers need four kinds of knowledge. Um, and he started with a distinction that's long made in educational psychology, that there are two kinds of knowledge, declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is knowledge of what? Um, it's, it's knowledge that you can say. Procedural knowledge is knowledge of how. It's knowledge that can only be performed. Then George argued that writers need knowledge both of form and of substance. You have to know the formal features of the text that you're trying to produce, and you've got to know about the stuff that you're writing about. So if you put it together, you have this two-by-two two matrix, declarative knowledge of form, procedural knowledge of form, declarative knowledge of substance, and procedural knowledge of substance. Now, those don't, things don't happen in a vacuum. So they're all nested in a context. And that's the fifth kind of knowledge we talk about in the books, knowledge of context. The, if, I went, if I went on for a half an hour here, I know the context, the particular context is, I'm talking to National Writing Project teachers, and I have 13 minutes, or one of my colleagues here is going to you know, that knocked me off the stage. I have to understand that those are the constraints, and that's the situation in which I'm operating. So we have five kinds of knowledge. And we think that, the, uh, here's examples. So declarative knowledge of form in the teaching of argument would be knowing the names of the aspects, the elements of Toulmin's model of argumentation, data, war, and claim, being able to define those. But procedural knowledge of form would be able to write a warrant. Knowing what a warrant is doesn't mean that you can write a, a one. Declarative knowledge of substance is knowing the stuff about which you're going to write. So if I'm going to write an interpretive essay about a book, I probably should have read the book. I need to know what the book is. Procedural knowledge of substance is, how do you get the stuff about which you're going to write? How do I read a text noticing the stuff? How do, in Stuart Green's word, how do I read a text uh, mine a text in reading as a writer, because reading as a writer is different than reading as a reader in some kinds of ways. If you're going to use a text for your own work, you might read in different ways. You have to pay attention to different kinds of things. G. 
Jim's going to be talking more about how those five kinds of knowledge would play out. So I'm going to talk about, spend the rest of my time with you today talking about five kinds of composing. That we think that those five kinds of knowledge can be developed by five kinds of composing. And what Jeff wrote on the first slide is, his vision of this is the writing process on steroids. Um, composing to plan is one, is, one kind of, is one kind of writing. So, for example, if the letter that you wrote to one of you, to your mentor, you, that's composing to plan if you later use it to write something about the, to write something about what, what meaning a mentor teacher is for a student teacher, okay? Um, when Jeff and I wrote Reading Don't Fix No Chevys, we spent about a year figuring out how we were going to collect the data that, that, that Tanya talked about. Um, that's composing to plan. We, we wrote interview questions. We practiced interview questions. We developed, we wrote some scenarios that we wanted the kids to respond to. That's composing to plan. The journals that many of you keep is composing to plan. Those are going to, you're going to go back to those journals in order to write from them. Composing to practice is, um, I want to talk about in the books we make an argument for antis anticipatory teaching. So there's an idea that what we try to do is in, in you wait for teachable moments, right? Your kid gets to a place in the, in, in the writing that he or she is doing, and you say, they come to you and say, I need help with this, and that's a teachable moment. Or you notice that they need help. That's a teachable moment, right? Well, I taught high school for a lot of years, and my ninth graders, when they wrote narratives, never included enough dialogue, ever. Now, I knew that. I knew that that was true. I didn't have to wait for that to happen. So if I wanted them to include dialogue, maybe I should spend time before they're writing their stories to help them develop some skills and understand the utility of that, or develop an ability to write dialogue, and give them practice, 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 practice. So when they were writing their narratives, that they would have, that they would feel confident in being able to do that. That's composing to practice. And it, and it resonates with, um, you've been reading about, I, I want to argue that one of the biggest enemies of teachers of writing is a belief in talent. Now, it's sort of interesting to me. Have you ever heard anybody say she's a born reader? <laughs> Nobody says that. But people do say he, she's a born writer or he's a born writer. A belief in talent obviates our, takes us off the hook. Because if, if there are talented writers and untalented writers, then we're just there to celebrate or, or boo. Um, but we know from, what we know from research on talent is that talent without practice doesn't get you very far. That experts in every field need about 10,000 hours of focused and directed practice in their domain of expertise. So we've got to give it, our students a chance to practice. And we've got to think about ways as teachers to create efficiencies so that they're able to do that in, in our classes. With all the stuff that we have to do, We've got to figure out ways to give them enough practice before we ask them to, to employ those talents in significant ways. First draft composing is something that we're all, uh, we, we, if we had the chance to write the books over, we would call it first drafts composing, by which we mean that the writing, the getting started, the thinking about stuff, the changes that you make, the mucking around that you do, well before you get to the editing stage, which is the, which we're thinking about the final draft, the editing and polishing stage. So the idea of deep revision about does this fit, taking stuff out. When Jeff and I write books, Jeff and I write different, different ways. And Jeff writes, um, how should we say? Well, I didn't mean it quite like that. But he, Jeff writes, Jeff gets stuff out and cuts from out. I send Jeff like haiku, and he spins them out into chapters. <laughs> You know, so we, we, that's, the diff, that, we, that's why we, we can work together. So that, that's the working from the first draft. And then when we get to final draft, then we can polish. Then we can do that kind of stuff. And then I want to argue that the single most important thing, well, I'm going to st start again. I think that sometimes as teachers of writing, we pretend that every paper our students writing, are working on is the last paper they'll ever write, and it's the one that decides whether they're going to get to heaven or not. <laughs> And the truth is, with the possible exception of college, and college application essays, no single paper that we teach our kids matters. What matters is what they learn in that, teach, in that writing that they can bring into new situations. 
And the data on transfer is terrible. That is, people don't apply what they learn from one situation to the next. So we want to argue, in our, we argue in our books, when we, we want to make an argument that as teachers we have to, the single most important thing we have to care about as teachers of writing is the issue of transfer. That is, what am I working on them to, with today that's going to help them tomorrow and next week and next year? How many minutes? Okay. So this is fast. Um, so say that I, this is my this is my favorite portrait. It's uh, Velasquez's portrait. It's a uh, portrait of Court de Ward for Don Sebastian de Moro. So I want you to just think for a minute about preparing kids to write an interpretive argument about literature. And I want you to think for a minute about what Velasquez wants us to understand about him. If I had more time, I'd have you share. <laughs> but using a visual, th if we're going to write interpretive essays about characters, I need to think about what kind of knowledge my kids need. Well, the thing I think kids need, the threshold concept for understanding a literary text is that a literary text is an intentional act, that what is didn't have to be. And I think that the way that we leverage understanding is to think about what is against what could have been. So why? In understanding this portrait, we have to ask, he, does, he could have made it a three-quarters piece. Why does he have him seated? He could have had his hands this way. Why, why didn't he? So as experienced understanders of, of texts, we read what is against what could have been. As soon as I name that move, I can teach it to my kids. I can say, notice what is, think of what could have been, and use that as a way to leverage your interpretation. And here's where David, here's one of the ways where David Coleman is wrong in what he writes about around the CCSS. The stuff about text-dependent questions is, I would argue, wrong. Because text-dependent questions only work on the text that they're depending on. So what I, if what we want, on the other hand, David Coleman is right, and we want kids to attend and grapple with the text that we place, otherwise you can't learn from them. Right? If I'm going to learn from this portrait, I have to grapple with it. So I want to argue that what we want to do instead in thinking about composing to transfer is helping our students develop an articulated understanding of the moves that they employ in particular situations and then give them extended practice doing it so by the end they can both name it and feel confident that they can do it. I think that I can show in one block five, six portraits, three, five, where we practice that. Look at what is, think of what could have been, what does that mean? So what we're trying to, what we're thinking about, what we hope that, uh, one of the things I hope that you take from this, from this practice is that we can have our kids be scratch golfers, but doing so means we've got to think really, really hard about what we do as experienced readers and writers and give our kids extended practice and then give them articulated understandings that they can transfer to new situations. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say, I, I might never get another chance to say thank you to all of you all at one time. So thank you for everything that you're doing. And, and um, it's really a privilege to be part of a network with you and a privilege and an honor to get to speak for a few minutes to you today. So um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about are the five kinds of knowledge. And I'm going to spend time talking about two of them in particular. Uh, what Michael kind of walked through are the, the five kinds of composing, which I, th I think would are helpful in terms of planning your instruction, designing the order of your instruction. And I think the five kinds of knowledge are, are really helpful in terms of assessing and trying to think about what do I need to pay attention to when kids are doing things in order to know if they really understand it. So I'm going to talk about um, um, the, purpose, the knowledge of purpose and context and procedural knowledge of substance in terms of narrative. Um, and so before we get to those two kinds of knowledge, I, I think we need to have some common understanding of what narrative is. So strangely, it took me a long time to get to this point, but this is what I think narrative is. I think narrative is about trouble and how people respond to it. And um, 
trouble uh, can mean a lot of different things, but I, I think it means that it's a break in what people expect. Um, it can look like uncertainty, it can look like ambiguity, it can look like a direct challenge, it can feel like failing and flailing, uh, it could feel like falling short and flopping. Um, and this matters a great deal because, um, like Michael alluded to, um, I think it's really important, maybe the central thing that I want students to walk away from my course is understanding that they can improve, they can change, they can get better, that they don't have to be who they are now, they, they can think about who they want to be and work toward it. And that is what Peter Johnston and Opening Minds and Carol Dweck and Mindset uh, call a dynamic mindset versus those students who have a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset would be one in which you don't think you can get better. Uh, you are a fixed set of traits. I am a good writer or I'm not a good writer. Not, I'm not a good writer yet. Um, and so if we think about this in terms of the, the common core uh, standards, that's a document that asks students to be producers, uh, to be active, uh, rather than just consumers and being passive. Uh, uh, it asks them to make texts, to make meanings of other people's texts. It asks them to, to make a case for why they just did what they did. So to look back at something they did and then think about what went well when they did it and what they could change for another context. Uh, as teachers of writers, we know that when people engage in the process of creating and crafting, they face trouble of all kinds. They face moments of decisions, of not knowing the outcome in the, in, the, in the process of doing it. And acts of discovery require courage, and they lean on the power of yet. So this isn't the way I want it to sound yet. This isn't as clear as I hope it to be yet. This isn't as automatic as I expect it to be yet. So we need to, I think, we need to help uh, people see narratives in the world and to see the work that narratives do for people. So this is the first kind of knowledge that we talk about, the knowledge of purpose and context. And it, and it basically asks, where, when, and why do people use this kind of thinking, this narrative thinking? Or if you're thinking about argument, where, when, and why do people use argument? And where, when, and why do people use informational text? Uh, and for me, narratives appear in places where people are dealing with trouble. So you can think about this in terms of careers, right? You can think about lawyers, mental health professionals, um, designers. Think about Click and Clack, the Tappert Brothers on NPR. <laughs> um, you might think of medicine. Uh, often you can go to a doctor and it can feel like they just want a, uh, you to describe a set of symptoms and then they make an argument about what it is. Or doctors can practice narrative medicine and ask you about the story of your illness. And you think about where things begin and, and where they might be. Um, so in these, in these kinds of contexts, people are dealing with, uh, in which people are dealing with trouble, trouble can help us see what our hopes are and why they matter to us. Trouble can reveal our motivation and why we do what we do. In other words, they can help us trouble. When we face trouble or when somebody faces trouble, we, that gives us an opportunity to see what we believe things ought to be and what things could be. Um, and trouble helps us see what we expect and reveals to us where those expectations might come from. So this doesn't happen just in, um, in literature, for instance. Uh, I was working with a seventh grade math teacher in our project, Ramey Uriarty, and he was struggling with this unit he was doing on teaching proportions, and he couldn't think of a question to help frame it, to frame the unit. And I asked him, well, why do mathematicians use proportions? Like, what does that do for people? And he said, well, proportions help people know what's coming next. So he was teaching it and thinking about it in terms of narrative. And that, so the, the inquiry question became, where do our, what are our expectations and where do they come from? And so for him, they come from seeing a pattern of proportions, one after the other after the other. Um, so I think, um, uh, I think what we charge to do then when, when we think about this is that we want students to compose a wide range of texts um, 
that employee narrative. So um, I'm going to show a few slides here of one kind of text. Um, and it's a, it's a series of slides from a museum exhibit. And it's from the Field Museum in Chicago, uh, my hometown. And they have a um, series of slides, they have a, a, an exhibit there called the, a, the Evolving Planet. So the main character in the story as you go through the exhibit are different life forms. Um, the story world is our planet. Um, the, the sort of filter of the story, the narrator of it seems to be um, Earth and kind of just sort of reporting out what's happened to things that have existed on it over time. So I just want to show you this. And then what, what, what struck me as I was going through the exhibit was they have these moments of decided trouble for life forms. Um, so you'll see the, the beginning of the exhibit starts with um, this little passage and it, you know, introduces sort of the setting and where we're at and it has this idea of life evolving as sort of a theme that's going to run through this, that, that things change, life forms change and adapt and grow. And, um, and then this is where it begins. It sets the stage, the story world. Four billion years ago, this is when the story begins, right? And then from here we begin to see all sorts of different life forms at different times, and then all of a sudden there are these moments of trouble. Mass extinction number one, <laughs> right? And then after the extinction, then there is a few more. Now, I thought there was only one. I thought it was the Ice Age, and there were dinosaurs, and then we had the Ice Age, and then we came around. Um, but there are actually six, there's six, six max, mass extinction times. Um, and then they have this, this big, dinosaur hall where all these dinosaurs are and then you kind of continue through the kind of continue through the exhibit and then they end with this passage from Darwin about how life evolves. Now this is structured in a narrative way. This is, an, this is narrative thinking at play. It's telling you the story of life over time and if I was a young person going through this or you know even um, well, you might not think it's narrative as you're going through it because it doesn't look like a story. It doesn't necessarily follow the fray tag triangle um, of rising action and falling action and things like that. Instead, it's centered around this notion of trouble and how life forms responded to it. And that creates the, the, um, the structure to the experience. Um, so the next kind of knowledge is, um, so if we think about where and when, and why narratives are around, then we got to think about this next kind of knowledge, which, which we're calling the procedural knowledge of substance. So to do that, you got to think about, well, what are, what are the substances? What, is the, what are narratives made of? So I did a lot of reading around narrative theory and read a lot of stuff, and, and this, these seem to be the five substantive things of narratives that I could kind of figure out. So the character makes sense, the story world where, where we're at. Time, there's a beginning and an end, and there are things that happen in there. And then I, I started using these, this language of filter and slant instead of point of view. And filter would be who we follow, and the slant would be sort of the, the narrator's attitude toward that. So a real clear example of this would be the Wonder Years. They'll show from way back when. And in that, in that show, you follow Kevin. You follow a 10-year-old Kevin as that, that series begins. And the narrator for that, the slant toward it is sort of this nostalgic slant of the older Kevin looking back on it. Or if you've never watched The Wonder Years, um, you might think of A Christmas Story with Ralphie, right? Where he, we follow him at that time, but then there's this sort of attitude. Now this is slightly different, I think a little bit more generative for young people than thinking about third person omniscient versus third person limited. Right? This, this makes a little bit more generative sense to them. So this kind of knowledge, though, is not just about knowing what those things are, but it's actually knowing how to invent or find them. So if you're inventing a story, students will need to know how to craft these things and create them. If you're writing uh, narrative nonfiction, you need to know how to identify and find these things uh, in order to craft a story. Um, so we're going to just look at one real quick here, the character. How do, how do we help students craft characters? So there's this heuristic that I've been using for a long time that seems to work. I don't always quite know why, but it, it works for young people. And so what I have my students often do, I taught middle school for a long time, uh, and 
I have them collect characters. So for me, I, this, this heuristic comes from Peter Ruby and Gary Provo's book. It's a little bit older now. It's called How to Tell a Story. And the WAGS test seems to really work. And where I, I often start, I don't go in order of the W, then the A, then the G, then the S. I often start with the goal. So what is it somebody wants? Because that's where the trouble is going to be found, right? Something's going to get in the way of that. And then the real important thing is, why is that goal so important to the character? Why does it matter? What's at stake? And this is often what's missing from uh, the seventh and eighth graders I used to work with. This was the thing that was missing from their stories. They would have a goal and then they would have all these things happen, but there was never sort of this internal thing that was going on that was driving, uh, this, the, the, um, driving the character. The other th two things matter in that, well, the action makes sense. What are the, what are the steps a character takes in order to achieve that goal? And then the world of the story sort of depends on the character's view. So from the character's point of view, what in the world, what in his or her world um, creates opportunities for that goal to be realized? And what is it in that world that creates constraints or limitations? What gets in the way of it uh, from somebody achieving that goal? And if, by the way, if you uh, are, don't want to collect characters, you might collect story worlds with your characters and simply ask two questions. Who's in this world that wants, who's not in this world that wants to be there? Or who is in this world that wants to get out of here? And you will find characters. There's trouble that gets in the way. So I don't, do, I, do I have time? Yeah. OK. So <laughs> I'm going to have you create a character. All right? So we're going to do a little WAGS test here, and I'll walk you through this. So this is a, an old family photo that I'm not in. <laughs> yeah, this I can. Uh, so what I'd like you to do, though, is I'd like you to We'll go through the wax test just so you can see what it looks like. All right, so pick one of these characters that are up here. And on a piece of paper, write down what it is you think they want. And it can be what they want in this little situation in this room, or it can be just writ large. What is it they want? And then jot down, well, why do you think that would be important to that person? So I'm going to give you 15 seconds here. <laughs> And then what is it you think they've done or will do in order to achieve that goal, to have that goal be realized? What might they do or what have they done? And then where are the opportunities or the constraints in their world that make, um, that, make that pursuit uh, either easier or more difficult? So this would be sort of another example of that code composing to practice, right? You're kind of practicing, collecting a lot of characters, and then you can decide later which of these characters you want to pursue to actually create a more extended story. But you're just collecting stuff uh, and having students work through that in, in hopes and in, um, and in pursuit of understanding how narrative works and being able to spot trouble and what's behind it and what people do in response to it. Um, so if we have students craft a wide range of texts that employ narrative, it helps us and it helps them see the wide range of ways that people respond to trouble. Do they freeze up? Do they paralyze? Do they operate from a place of fear? Or do they have a more dynamic mindset, a place of hope? Uh, and if we do that, then, then we free up space um, for that which has not happened yet. For, our, for the young people. Okay, thanks a lot. Have fun. Well, good morning, everyone. I do want to say, now that I have the stage, that uh, you know they say that one of the greatest sources of pride of a teacher is to have your students supersede you. So I do want to say one of my greatest sources of pride is Tanya Baker, who was Who was once my student, but now I'm hers. Uh, my older daughter once said to me, who's your boss? And I said, well, that would be Tanya Baker. <laughs> I also want to mention that one of my greatest sources of pleasure 
has been working with Michael and Jim over the last many years. And we had such a good time writing these books and learned so much together, and I learned so much from them. And I finally want to say that one of my greatest, well, the greatest source of professional fulfillment I have is working with the National Writing Project. And that's been true for me for 30 years. <laughs> And I do want to give a shout out to the Boise State Writing Project Fellows. Many of them are here today because they did a lot of work on these books, embedding these strategies in units that they're teaching to be models for meeting the common core. And some of those units are featured in our books, and a lot of them are alluded to. OK, enough about other people. Let me talk about me. <laughs> so I want to tell you something about my career as a teacher. Here's how it went for a long time. I decided I was going to give my students lots and lots of really hard writing assignments that I would never help them to do so I could spend all my weekends grading really crummy papers and getting angry at my students. <laughs> and that was pretty much my life for a long time. Now I've got a better idea. We've got a better idea. It's prepare the kids for success. Now, what we're proposing is to do fewer formal writing assignments. But don't, don't be mistaken. We're proposing that the kids write more than they ever have before. My kids are writing every day, practicing, 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 writing claims, writing reasons, uh, doing uh, debates. Their little fingers are becoming bloody nubs. <laughs> but at the end of the day, when they have to write a formal argument or a formal narrative or a, former, a formal in informational text, they're doing a great job because they've planned. They've got the stuff in their notebook to write about. They've practiced meeting every single criterion. When it comes time to write it, they do it. Now, I take one set of papers home every six or seven weeks. I can grade them in a the morning because I've seen them several times already. I can use primary trait scoring. I'm done at noon. I take my wife to a matinee movie. My life is way better. <laughs> I'm not angry at the kids. They're not angry at me. They have visible signs of accomplishment. This, I'm just telling you, this is better. Now, if you look at the writing standards in the Common Core, the first three are write arguments, write informative explanatory text, and write narratives. You might notice those are the three topics of our books. Now, one of the things, just saying, one of the things that's been causing a lot of kerfluffles with the Common Core is that there's this assertion that by the end of high school, 70% of the reading and writing we're doing in schools should be informational text. I do want to point out that doesn't say that it's an English class. It says it's across subjects. So we're not going to lose narrative, you know, which is so powerful. And Jim did such a great job of exploring why. Uh, what it does mean is we will have to do more teaching of informational text. And I would argue, well, we do argue, that that should be in conjunction with narrative and argument text. And we're going to need to be more explicit about teaching these texts. It also means we're going to have to help our colleagues in content areas to do more and more explicit teaching of the reading and writing of informational text. So we've got a couple of challenges that we're facing here with informational text. Now, if you read the Common Core State Standard document, they list these different text types or thought patterns as informational text types. Naming, listing, summarizing, describing, process description, which they also call explaining or how-to text, defining an extended definition, comparing, classifying, which they also call differentiating and grouping, cause and effect, and problem and solution. So that's a list of 10 different kinds of informational text structures kids are supposed to have nailed by the time they graduate and are college and career ready. One of the things we found that was fascinating and interesting and, and challenging was that these text types are way more interesting and way more challenging and complex than people usually think. Now, Jerome Bruner talks about narratives 
as the primary mode of mind, as the way we typically think about and construe the world. And the logic is chronology. He talks about argument and informational text as being paradigmatic text. So they depend on patterns. Argument depends on claims, data, and reasoning about the claims to connect the data to the claim. Now, that's, that's a pattern. Informational text structures and arguments use patterns to do functional work. Now, Bruner says this about the paradigmatic. To perceive is to categorize, to conceptualize is to categorize, to learn is to form categories, to make decisions is to categorize. That means that for each kind of informational text structure, it embodies a specific pattern of thinking with and through categories. So each one of those 10 is a different way of thinking with and through categories to get different kinds of work done. In turn, this means that teaching students how to understand, produce, and use informational text structures as readers and as writers means that we are teaching them how to think with these categorical patterning tools. As writers and as readers, to understand text structures as thought patterns, to be able to generate and comprehend such structures, students must understand the purpose of the text structure, you know, what work it does, the context in which it can do such work, knowledge of context, the content, substance, and how the content is structured to meet the purpose to create specific meanings and effects. So you will notice these are our five kinds of knowledge. Knowledge of purpose and context, knowledge of content, both procedural and declarative, and knowledge of form, both procedural and declarative. So this is the gut check that we're uh, asking teachers to, to go through when they plan units where kids are going to write extended text. We have to make sure that students engage in activities that help them, one, to understand the purpose and context in which they are writing and the work that's going to get done. We're asking them to access prior knowledge and learn new invention strategies for developing new knowledge. That's procedural knowledge of substance. And when you've done that, you've got new declarative knowledge of substance. And three, practice shaping and structuring your data, the stuff you've generated, into conventional forms that exert particular meanings and effects. That's procedural knowledge of form, which is going to lead to declarative knowledge of form. What I'm going to talk about today is listing, which is a very simple thought pattern and text structure. But it's way more complicated than I used to think, and it's implicated in summaries and defining and describing in every other text structure. So it's worth teaching. Now, the first kind of composing is composing a plan, and when you plan, you're going to develop knowledge of purpose and context. Here's a couple invention strategies we've been using with students in schools. Just simple brainstorming. When do you generate list? Or we do ethnographic seek and finds. When you come back tomorrow, have a list of all the lists you've seen, of all the lists people are generating. You know, so we're basically asking them when you use listing in your everyday life. Now, this is a great move to make for two reasons. Number one, it shows them you're not just doing school. You're teaching them a strategy that's going to work in their life, that obtains beyond the unit and the context in which you're teaching listing. Uh, it's also great because it gets them started with what they already know, which is the only resource they have to learn new things. So when do you use listing in your everyday life? Well. In my house, I'm the person who keeps the grocery list and goes and does the grocery shopping. I'm also a kayaker. I do a lot of outdoor things. So I've got lists for when I go kayaking. Now, what work do these lists get done? Well, number one, it placeholds the stuff that you need to get at the grocery store so you don't have to go back later. Number, uh, you know, for kayaking, it makes sure you've got all your gear. Because if you don't have all your gear when you get to the river, guess what happens? A kid said, you drown. I go, no. You don't get in the boat. You, you get to be the shuttle bunny driving other people around who are having fun. So it's important to have your list, right? You got to place all the stuff. You got to have what's necessary. So it gets work done. Now, we do listing in all of our disciplinary work, and a lot of work gets done through these lists. Now, once kids have this knowledge of purpose and context, you need to, to 
start figuring out how can I help them generate the materials for a list. But they're going to have to have an immediate context in which to write those lists. So another step you take as a teacher is to create an essential question. Reframe what you're teaching as a problem to be solved that would require and reward the writing of list. And of course, this is true for any other kind of text structure you want to teach. I taught a unit recently, what do we need to survive and thrive middle school? <laughs> now, you could obviously ask that, what do we need to survive and thrive, or what do we need to survive and thrive while living in a foreign culture? You could apply that to a lot of different uh, situations in school. We decided that what we needed to do was to create a guide for sixth graders coming into the middle school and that we were going to create a guide filled with list. What do you need to know about your locker? What do you do if you are bullied? You know, so these guides are filled with list. We have like 253 different languages in the Boise schools. We translated these guides into several different languages for refugee kids who are going to be new to the school. So it became a service learning project in a lot of ways. This provides knowledge of purpose and context that immediately rewards and requires the generation of list and that gives you a payoff for making the list. Now, composing a plan, procedural knowledge of substance. What strategies do we have for generating and inventing the stuff? Now, when I go to the grocery store, what am I doing during the week? If I notice we're low on something, I write it on the list. So, I'm observing. My family is not hip to this yet after 25 years, right? <laughs> if you notice something is low or you use it, put it on the list. Uh, another thing I do is I think of the meals we're going to eat in the next week, and I go through the pantry to see do we have all of those things. Those are strategies of invention. They might sound simple to you, but kids may not know them. Here's another thing I do. Before I go to the grocery store, I reorganize the list into the order in which I go through the grocery store. <laughs> so now I'm to procedural knowledge of form, right? I'm making my list more significant. Now, what are these strategies of invention? I might think about going through the grocery store. That's called a geo scan. I might think about our meals. That's called a schedule scan. I might think about my body when I'm going kayaking. Do I have my helmet? Do I have my PFD? Do I have my paddle? Do I have my skirt? I look very good in my skirt. Do I have my kayak? If you're missing one of those five things, you don't get the kayak. So I go through a body scan before I get into the car. Buying presents, you know, uh, holidays are coming up. What do you do when you buy presents? How do you generate the stuff for your list? Well, I do interviews and surveys. I interview my wife about my daughters. I interview my daughters about my wife, right? <laughs> now. That seems simple, but kids may not know how to compose an interview or a survey to generate the stuff, so it's a teaching opportunity to help them. Composing to practice, procedural knowledge of substance and form. Now, there are different kinds of lists. There are simple lists. They're basically disorganized, and they're significant lists. They have an organizing principle. So what I do with the kids is I do think-alouds of list to model the strategies for generating list, understanding list, forming the list, et cetera. And then I give them lists that they revise, then they start generating their own list and working on that. Here's a heuristic for reading list. And you could use this when you're reading the Common Core State Standards. What's the topic of the list? Anchor standards in reading. I actually think there's another topic that's implicit, which you will come to. What's the purpose of the list? The things the kids need to know about reading, to meet the Common Core career and college readiness standards. Is the list simple or significant? It's significant. I think it's hierarchical and chronological. If significant, what are the ordering principles? Well, I just told you. What are the repeated motifs, themes, like analysis, evidentiary reasoning, inferencing? And then you can move towards summary, right? Because you know the topic, and you know the key details, and what pattern and comment is made by that pattern. OK, I'm just going to conclude by giving you a few lists. These are some of the things we do with kids. We like to start with things the kids may know about, where they can stake their identity. That has nothing to do with the unit. So here's a list. What is the topic of this list? Anybody know? It's not sports teams. It's 
Yes, sports teams that have moved from their original city. Then I say to the kids, is it a significant list? Some kids know enough to know it's not. And then I go, how could you make it a significant list? And they say, oh, an ordering principle might be chron chronological. The Philadelphia Athletics were the first team to move, then the Washington Center, so you could do it chronologically. Uh, one kid said, oh, you could do economic impact of the move. You know, that'd be another way to make a significant list. So then they do the research and they recreate it as a significant list. Then for our survival unit, I start using the list where we're using content from our inquiry into survival. Water, food, shelter, clothing, affection. What's the topic of the list? Yeah, things you need to survive. Is it a significant list? Is there an ordering principle? Yeah, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So notice we're doing content while we're doing listing. We're getting what I love, which I call a twofer. Now, what do you do next? You have, you have students add to the list you've created. They might need to do research. They might need to learn. Create their own list related to the unit. Create list with outliers. Share and respond to each other, all the while identifying topic and organizing principles. They are practicing, practicing, practicing generating the stuff of list, generating the structure of list. Final activity, banana, apple, Snickers, rice cracker, peanuts. What's the topic of the list? Yeah, we could say snacks. I might say, we're doing survival. Let's, let's be more specific about the kind of snacks. So they might say, healthy snacks. I might say, does, is one of these then an outlier? Now we're getting the definition, right? Specific examples, contrastive examples. Uh, it was funny, one kid said rice cracker. I go, why is that the outlier? I go, it tastes bad. <laughs> well, quickly they got to the, the point where they go, yeah, the banana, apple, rice cracker, peanuts are complex carbohydrates, very good for survival in the long term. Snickers is simple sugars, bad for survival in the long term. The one kid said, if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, that would be good to have a snicker for that short-term energy. Now, once you've practiced, 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 generating the stuff, practicing, uh, ordering the stuff, you know, that procedural knowledge of substance and form, then you say, okay, it's time to create our guide for survival in the middle school and to make our list and to make sure they're ordered. And then, of course, you're doing drafting and final draft. And then throughout, we're doing this composing to transfer. So every day I say to them, I have these concentric circle charts where I'll say, what have you learned about listing? What have you learned about survival? Next day, layer on another layer. What's something new you learned about listing? So they're naming what they're learning and want to carry forward to the final composition and to the future. Muddy Marvy, what's something that you're not quite getting about listing? What's something that's totally cool about listing you're going to want to remember forever? Formative assessments where the kids name what they're learning so they can bring it forward into the future. Again, you might have thought lists are pretty simple. We found they are wonderful and complicated and can do so much work for the kids if we take the time to teach them and give them uh, the practice. Final comment. My daughters often come home from school looking glum. I'll say to them, what's up, sweetie? Quite often they'll go, I've got a paper due. I ask them, when's it due? Invariably, they say, tomorrow. <laughs> I'll say, what are you going to write about? They go, I don't know. I'll say, what are the criteria? Not sure. OK, now I, I blame my daughters a lot for this. But I'm also blaming their teachers. How do you get to the day before an assignment is due and you haven't practiced, 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 generating all the stuff you need to put in that paper? And how do you get to the day before a paper's due and you haven't practiced, 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 meeting every single criterion? They ought to have it all right there and sit down and write their paper. What's happening is we're assigning and evaluating and not taking the time to get after these things which are pretty complicated so that the kids really own how do I generate the stuff next time I write a list or a definition or whatever and how do I structure that stuff so it does the maximum part of work. I thank you for being the kind of people who do that kind of work. Thank you very, very much and have a great conference.